Hello and welcome to Maiden Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Helen Joyce. She's a former mathematician, journalist at The Economist, and the author of Trans, Where Ideology Meets Reality, a huge best-selling book from a couple of years ago, which I'm sure you'll come across, all about the rise of gender identity ideology and how it came to capture our institutions. She's also the Director of Advocacy at Sex Matters, a campaigning group that seeks to emphasise the importance of sex differences in law and policy. We spoke about, well, the importance of sex differences in law and policy, the origins of gender identity ideology and how it came to be so powerful. We spoke about the British situation, whether or not TERFs have won in Britain, whether or not the existence of the NHS, for instance, has protected Britain from some of the more extreme manifestations of transgenderism that we've seen in the United States and elsewhere. And we spoke about feminism, where it's going, whether or not feminists should work with the right, whether or not feminism is moving to the right, whether or not feminism ought to exist at all. We covered a lot. It was a really great discussion. Helen has such an amazing mind. The fact that she's a mathematician really shines through when she's talking about some of these, some of these topics. Enjoy. Cards on the table. I've been a, I've been a turf for like 10 years since before it was since before it was cool and there was this period back in the sort of early 2010s when no one was talking about this pretty much except Julie Bindle a handful of other radical feminists who were being raked over the coals for it and this was it was not in the times it was not in the spectator it was nowhere and now I mean, my view, maybe this is too optimistic, I'm interested to hear what you think, is that actually gender critical side has pretty much won, has at least won public opinion on the whole. Whether or not we've yet won the legal battles, the legislative battles, I think in terms of the ability now to speak openly about this, maybe it's over. In the terms of the ability to speak about it, yes, Definitely. And of course, majority opinion was never that it was a good idea to pretend that men could be women Mm. and women could be men and that children should be told that that's the case and so on and so forth. But the things that worry me are that one, uh, education has been captured. So schools and universities to a large extent. So... It, you know, it's not true that young people overwhelmingly believe mm-hmm. this stuff, but they do much more believe it than older people. So there's a lot to be won back there. And then the second thing that worries me, well, three, I'll, I'll make it three. So the second thing of three that worries me is that a lot of ground has been lost while we weren't looking. So we're now going to have to fight for, in both law and in practice, getting back things that we had before in the way of single sex spaces and sports and so on. And the third thing that bothers me is that whenever anything is to do with women's rights, Mm -hmm. people think that uh, compromise is the answer. So, you know, we'll be we'll be lucky to keep the known rapists out of women's jails. Like instead of just going back to the blanket rule of saying no men in women's jails, it'll be like, well, if he's currently serving for a rape conviction, we won't let him in. But we all know that most rapes are never reported, let Mm. alone turned into prosecutions, let alone turned into convictions. So obviously there are going to be a load more rapists in men's jails than the ones we know about. But when you say that, they'll say, well, what's your proof? My proof is just what I know about men and women. And we used to understand that and understand what that meant for safeguarding. So we're having these incredibly frustrating fights about things that half a second ago were obvious. Um, and, And while we're doing that, we're not doing things that we actually need to be doing, answering technological change. Uh, how you know how are men and women meant to get on? How are we meant to cope in the age of technology and the internet? Um, you know, climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all the things that we might like to want to talk about, and instead we're back to this frustrating, stupid attempt to claw back rights that we didn't even know were at, we were we were losing. So yeah, okay, you can you can call Adam Graham slash Isla Bryson he every mm. now and then in papers. They're still mostly calling him she. Even the Times, which today called him he in an editorial. It was she in the in the news reporting? This is just a man. Yeah, yeah, and that's the Times, which has been really good on this because of Janice Turner. Yes, 
that is true. And you're completely right that it's this, this running to stay in one place has been such a feature of this debate for such a long time. I mean, again, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm persevering at the optimism. I, I do also think that having been forced to have this conversation and it being so contentious and so painful has also led to changes within feminism, which I think are actually positive. I think that we, we have been forced to explain why biological sex is as important as it is in ways that I think have actually, it's probably actually had a kind of refreshing effect on feminist thinking. I also think that it's pulled women into feminist activism who previously were not in it, weren't interested in it, but who confronted on, say, Mum's Net, the egregious absurdity of all of this and thought, hang on, what? And now those women are now engaged and I'm hoping are going to stay engaged when it comes to things like online porn, prostitution, child sexual, you know, all of the other stuff that's been going on for, for such a long time and has remained just as much of a problem as it ever was. My hope is that those, those women who were engaged by the trans stuff are going to stay engaged. I really think that, that I, I agree with you on both of those. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know how many will stay engaged, but some will. And feminism had become yes. a sort of a luxury activity in universities. I mean, largely because we thought, most of us, that it was fine, that we didn't need to keep fighting, that we'd reached a point that each of us could individually live as we wished. And then it turned out just how fragile our rights were. Like, so extraordinary that a man says he's a woman and suddenly he's the most important person in the world. And a woman says, hang on, this doesn't mm. suit the rest of us very well. And we're bigots. Like, it just shows you how little concern was ever really given to women and women's concerns. It's extremely good proof for patriarchy. <laughs> I, in general, think the word patriarchy doesn't describe anything especially useful. And I think it, it, it is so incendiary that I often tend to avoid using it. Like, there's a way of using it. Really it really is. It really is. It's not a word I tended to use. But if it describes anything, surely it must be this kind of instant status attached to men, just, you know, the, the male rapist who says he's a woman and gets transferred. I mean, if that's, if that's not patriarchy, then what is? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's male sexual entitlement. So it's part of a male sexual entitlement movement. Um, I think I see it as part and parcel of the way that things that were genuinely liberatory got co-opted and turned back to front in a very queer theoretic sort of way, uh, like, for example, Pride. So Pride started out as being genuinely um, subversive. People, gay people, gay men saying, you know, I'm here, I'm queer, you know, I do these things mm -hmm. that are not meant to do and I'm willing to come out and say so. And that's amazing. And now it's just this corporate virtue signalling bullshit in which if it means anything, it means a chance for rainbow washing for corporations and for men to perform their fetishes in public and not and not answer when people say, look, there's children here or this is a public place. Take it, take it privately. Uh, I mean, I, I see these two as part of the same thing in men saying that they want to do what they want to do without any consideration for other people. And that's not what it was. It was the opposite to that. It was saying there are people who don't have full space in public and those people were not men and their and their fetishes. And now it's men and their fetishes are what's meant to be liberatory for all of us. It's depressing, really. And then on the terms of the feminine within feminism, I think, I can, again, I completely agree with you. For an awfully long time, feminism has been quite reality denying. And I see it yeah. as a kind of mirror image, I have to say, of a lot of trans activism. So the claim that um, a man can be a woman if that's how he feels doesn't seem to me in its reality denying nature to be very different from uh, there is nothing different about men and women except the accidents of their body and that it's all socialization. You know, these are these are neither of them evidence based. They're neither of them at all plausible and they're both of them very harmful to human beings. And when you have beliefs that are harmful to human beings, they're more harmful to women and children than they are to men in general. Interesting. And because women and children are just physically vulnerable in a way that men never will be in general. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yes. So I, I'm, yeah. I'm glad you've raised this. I have the same suspicion that to some extent the, it's entirely nurture 
none of its nature school of feminist thinking, which is a very dominant school, at least in the 20th century, softened us up for some of the trans stuff in that it became socially acceptable, even socially compulsory, to basically lie to be nice, to say, you know, why can't women be firefighters in exactly the same way that men can be? Um, every, you know, everything is to do with socialization. Everything can be can be rewritten if only we change the culture sufficiently. It's not that the socialization thesis is entirely wrong. It clearly is to some extent correct, but it's my view nowadays is that it is built on a biological substrate which isn't going anywhere. And even though, in a sense, trans ideology is directly counter to say radical feminist ideology because it says that you know the classic thing it says that if someone with a feminine brain must be a woman someone with a masculine brain must be a man you know that that's that kind of sexist view is, is obviously completely counter to radical feminist view which is that 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 femininity and masculinity are all nonsense constructs but it's similar in the sense that it's to do with kind of giving enormous agency to individuals and hugely downplaying the role of nature and evolution. Yes, it's similarly reality denying. Yeah, yeah. I think it did pave the way for where we've got to now. And it's also, so it 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 it's also it's not it's worse than lying to be kind. It's lying to be good. You're not a good person if you disagree with these theses, only bad people think. You know, this it's frustrating me more and more the the number of people I'm seeing. And I mean, I know when people say on all sides, it's one of those get out of jail free things. I really am criticising a large range of people here. But this this thing of ascribing only malign motives to people who disagree with you. So somebody thinking that if if somebody says, look, mm. men and women are different psychologically, not very different. Like they're measurable, small, specific areas, quite predictable sort of ways in which they're different. That that is somebody who must want bad things, must want women back in the kitchen, must want a return to the shaming of unmarried mothers or whatever, you know. I don't want any yeah. of those things. It just happens to be true. And when we lie to ourselves repeatedly, bad things happen. We build our society and our structures on lies. They won't fit us as well as they would. I want... You know, I want a 21st century that fits humans, all humans, male and female, adult and child. And at the moment, we're building a society that suits a small number of men and not really anybody else. I think you write about this very well. The sort of the, you know, the men who come out best on these dating apps are also the men who come out best in everything else in this mm -hmm. modern world. And we haven't built a world that's fit for other people at all. And that we can't do that unless we recognise difference that isn't going anywhere. Yeah. And the same with children. Children have needs that are... Yeah. Very, very inconvenient for adults. And those needs are, you know, in particular, uh, children are non-fungible goods. And the mm. the people that children need are non-fungible too. You can't substitute in carers. It's not a question of an hour or a pair of hands or um, mm. a set of tasks in the same way that factory work is. Children love one person or mm -hmm. two people, depending on their family situation, better than everybody else. And people don't feel the same about other people's children as they feel about their own. And if they say they do, then they shouldn't be parents because they don't love their own children enough. So that's not very convenient, but it's true. And I don't have a good answer as to how to accommodate it in a modern world. But I know that if you want to have an answer, you have to start yes. by acknowledging it. I mean, I wish, I wish government childcare policy acknowledged that particular fact. I mean, that that's a radical thing to say, that the that, that, that parents and children are not fungible, which of course they aren't. It's so obvious. But as you say, treating people as widgets um, serves a lot of different interests, including economic, economic interests. Speaking of, one of the things that you um, got a bit of... Um, yeah. got a bit of trouble over in um, in the book was talking about some of the economic factors behind um, the, the kind of medical industrial complex that has built up around transgender medicine and uh, can you speak a little bit about that about some of the the um, the responses on Twitter in particular to digging into these funders I think it's possible to overstate 
what's going on here. I've seen people say that they think that it's all a plot. It's actually a plot of the American medical industrial complex to create unnatural human mm -hmm. beings who will be uh, lifelong patients. I actually think that the healthcare system and the pharmaceutical industry relate to realising that this was a very um, attractive market. I mean, essentially what you're doing is you are doing cosmetic surgery on people with the same caveats that cos cosmetic surgery often comes with, which is that it doesn't make people happy. They want more. Um, but also if you are changing people's hormonal situation by taking away their own source of sex hormones, like you're taking out their gonads, then you're, you are making somebody who needs lifelong drugs. Now, they're not actually expensive drugs, except in America. I mean, in America, the pill costs loads. It costs pennies here to the NHS. But I mean, it's America where this is mostly being done. And so it is now a pretty lucrative uh, healthcare market. Um, I think something very similar happened with the recovered memory fiasco in the 1990s. And I should again do a sort of big throat clear before this. The fact is lots of children are abused. And the fact is people do forget what happened to them in early childhood and then slowly remember it when, you know, certain facts come to light and so on. But the sort of the sort of film version of this, which is that, you know, you grow up having literally no idea that anything ever happened to you, but you know something's wrong, you're not a happy person. And then a sort of thunderclap in a therapist's office and you remember enormously detailed, huge, very striking things that happened to you in childhood in great detail, like almost hallucinatorily. That's false. That's invented. That's a myth that was produced in books and was sold then in therapists' offices. And people had fact factitious memories created in effect by therapists. Well, that became a huge industry. Loads and loads of therapists made a lot of money because, again, because it was entirely false, it didn't actually help people. So they became permanent patients. In fact, they became worse. And it didn't really stop until the uh, a few people sued one and the um, mm. healthcare companies in America stopped covering this sort of therapy. And so that cut it off at the knees. And why did I get into trouble about it? I guess um, partly because people think you're saying it's a conspiracy theory. And, you know, sometimes you look and you think mm. it would almost be flattering to mm -hmm. say this is a conspiracy mm -hmm. theory. It's just more venal than that. It's just people responding to incentives. But also there's a strange sort of anti-Semitism that takes it that if you say something is done by shadowy people, you must mean the Jews. And I think that's quite anti-Semitic. So there's this thing that people say that, you know, oh, I picked Jewish billionaires. I mentioned three billionaires in the book of whom two are Jewish, as it happens. I didn't mention their religions, mm. but it was decided that all three of them were Jewish and that I had picked them because they were Jewish. And when it was pointed out that one of them actually isn't Jewish, people said, well, she must have thought he was Jewish because he sounded Jewish. At which point I'm just going, you know, look in the mirror. I guess it's um, smear tactics. This is how smears work. You say these things and you just keep saying them. I don't think there's much point in my engaging with them. I mean, it is just a fact that this is a pretty lucrative and fast growing area of medicine. It is also a fact that the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry are the biggest lobbies in America. Separately, pharma and, and uh, hospitals and healthcare providers are the two biggest or two of the three biggest. It is a fact that American politics and policy run on money. It's a fact that what Americans get in the way of healthcare is decided in Washington rooms where those healthcare lobbyists decide what gets covered in healthcare plans because the mandates say what has to go in. And the mandates now say that you must cover an extraordinary range of transgender medicine in particular for children. Do you think that the, um, what impact do you think the NHS has had in terms of the, how this has all unfolded in this country? I mean, the whole transgender phenomenon does seem to be an American import, right down to, you know, the particular drugs and surgical procedures and so on are so often developed in the States. Do you think that we have um, succumbed a little bit less to the kind of mass hysteria that seems to be taking place in the States because of the NHS, or do you think there are other factors as well? I think the NHS is a big factor, actually. Uh, the NHS is unusually stingy by the rich world standards. Yes. <laughs> and obviously on many occasions, that's a very bad thing, but it means that it's slow to offer new treatments without evidence of efficacy. 
And there is no evidence of efficacy for any of the things that are done as part of transgender medicine. In fact, mm. to the extent that there's evidence, it's evidence of non-efficacy. So anything the NHS is doing in this area is only because of pressure from lobbyists and not from its own standard procedures. The NHS did do two evidence reviews, I think it was late in 2021, I think, of cross-sex hormones and of the drugs that are used for um, Pediatric in paediatric medicine for gender, namely um, puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones for teenagers. And it just found that the evidence base is pretty much non-existent. And that is not the sort of thing the NHS normally funds. So it's been slow at the NHS. I mean, the Tavistock has been a disgrace, but it was a late disgrace. Um, it is also very centralised. If you want to try to fix um, American medicine, well, the way to do it would be through the mandates that say what healthcare policies have to cover. But there's loads of healthcare policies, there's loads of providers, and a lot of medicine in America is covered privately still. There's a lot of copay. There's very little copay here. It's it's mostly NHS. Um, to the extent that people are getting themselves or getting their children sterilised in the name of gender medicine, it's being done by the NHS here mostly. Um, and so it gives you one one target to fight and a target that has quite strong resistance to this sort of thing. The NHS is the world leader in cost benefit analysis for medical health care. You know, we have a specific institute that's talked about around the world, NICA, um, used to be called National Institute for Clinical Excellence, and they've put an extra letter in but not changed the acronym, possibly Health and Clinical Excellence. And it does the world's the world leading analyses of what you get for what you pay. And then the last thing I'd say is the NHS is the stingiest and most vicious negotiator on price of any healthcare purchaser in the world. Like the NHS buys drugs cheaper than anyone else because it's the single biggest buyer. It's not the biggest market, obviously, England, but it's the single buyer. So it gets the best prices. And sometimes that means that we just don't offer drugs that are available elsewhere because the seller won't sell them at the NHS price. But the NHS price is worked out by the cost benefit. So in all these ways, I think the NHS has managed to keep a lid on it, not by anybody within it being sensible, because actually the NHS is quite seriously captured by gender ideology. Like it's really using the language now, you know, talking about cervix havers and putting men who say they're women into what are meant to be women only wards. Um, I think if you go and get counselling here as a child, you'll probably be told some absolute nonsense about sex as a spectrum and gender identity is what matters. But when it comes to it, when it comes to the business of sterilising people, putting them on cross-sex hormones, doing surgery on their genitals, That's the NHS is slow. Slow, slow, um, slow. I guess also quite inelastic in terms of service provision because one of the very common complaints you'll hear from British trans activists is the very long waiting times for, for instance, youth, gender counselling um, and ultimately medical interventions, which is, of course, sort of absurd because part of the reason that, that waiting lists are as long as they are is because you've had this enormous explosion in demand and it just takes some time for NHS services to catch up in terms of expanding service provision. But, I mean, you'll know better than me that the, the, the increase, for instance, in young natal females suddenly seeking out this, these services is uh, enormous. I mean, we're talking in, like, in the thousands of percentage wise i think there are three thousand there are three thousand people on the waiting list for a thaloplasty so they're adults because we don't do that for children so that's women who want to have a it's chunk a taken off surgery. either an arm or a leg to turn into a fake penis yeah. and there's three thousand women waiting to do this and i think yeah and i think there's one center doing this so the nhs has succumbed to this and said that it's um it's taking tenders for two more centers to do this Mm. I would love to see what cost benefit analysis they did for that mm. because I've never seen anything that says that phalloplasty is good for people. But anyway, that's slow to have 3,000 people waiting. The sort of transhumanist end of the transgender movement um, who are all about kind of optimising the human body in every way possible, not just in terms of gender choice, but in, you know, in everything, intelligence, longevity, everything. And one of the arguments that I've heard from that, from that quarter on, for instance, phalloplasty, which I think we both know is a really bad surgery that doesn't work very well, causes terrible, terrible complications. You know, anyone who's seen sort of 
photos online or it's 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 the stuff of nightmares the argument from this quarter is we'll make it better you know if if down the line it becomes possible for people to have perfect medical interventions which result in kind of uh completely convincing representation of the opposite sex you know that should be the goal that's the argument and i think that my suspicion is that actually that wouldn't be a solution, that actually it wouldn't really make people happier, that there is a fundamental problem here with people being deeply, deeply unhappy. And I don't think that actually having better fake surgical penises is ever going to sol solve that. I think we're also a very, very long way away from making them perfect. I think it's an argument that people make who have not really had much in the way of medical intervention. You know, they talk about bodies as if bodies heal better than they do and as if medical interventions are better than they are. The things that medicine does really well, I mean, it, it, it cures us of infectious diseases. It gets rid of infectious diseases incredibly well and you can be back to where you were if you're lucky. But once, once something breaks or has to be removed and you have to put something fake in, and that's like if you get a kidney transplant or if you get um, breast implants or if you have your lip, lips puffed up or you, um, what else? Like I'm trying to think of when they, in, you know, when, when somebody intervenes in a part <laughs> of you yeah, and has to try and put in something else that works. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're not the same as you were beforehand. And, you know, of course, then you have to talk about the cost benefit. I mean, people do cesareans because women with some regularity die without cesareans. So that's the, that's the cost. The cost is that, you know, the cut is still there. Your uterus is never unscarred. You may not be able to have a natural delivery afterwards. The benefit is you've saved two people's lives, potentially quite large numbers of two people's lives. I mean, I've had my appendix out and that's a fairly harmless thing to do and that it was about to burst so the benefit was great but also we can live fine without an appendix but there's not many bits of you like that you know there's your gallbladder there's your appendix there's your tonsils there's your adenoids there's some bits like that that you can take out and you won't really notice but once you start talking about um, having a kidney transplant or a heart transplant or a lung transplant or um you know creating a new way of urinating which is what you're doing if you get a phalloplasty, like they've got to extend your urethra down a tube. You're not talking about something that's very likely to be highly functional. You're talking about something that's going to have a lot of scar tissue and isn't going to be, uh, for example, in the case of a neo-vagina, it's not going to be self-cleaning. And I don't see that getting to somewhere much better because I don't know how you could. The tissues inside a woman's vagina are not tissues that exist anywhere in a man. So there's nothing that you can use that will keep itself clean and lubricated and healthy the way that a woman's vagina does. And there's nothing that expands and contracts the way a woman's vagina does. There's just not something to do that with. So you'd have to be talking about real science fiction, really in Banks level of medicine, where you're able to do something at the genetic level and change the DNA and actually grow new body parts. And we're just, we're not even doing things that get you in that direction. Like, I don't know how we would do that. That would be a totally new departure in medicine. I don't see how you could take a chunk off somebody's thigh and turn it into something that make, is a convincing penis. Like think of all the things penises do, like they expand and contract and they come up and go down and you wee through them and you ejaculate through them. I mean, they're multifunctional things. How could we make out of a part of a woman's body a thing that could do that? And they feel, they've got loads of nerve endings. So yeah, the whole thing is just, in my opinion, an absolutely um, fool's endeavor really. And if the only reason that you would do it is if the other side of the scale was so extreme, because we do that with heart transplants. I mean, a heart transplant is an extraordinary thing to do and people don't live for ages with them because they've got to take such strong drugs to stop uh, rejection. But you're going to die. That's why we do it, because it's giving you something against a really bad outcome. I, I'm not sure what the how bad the outcome could possibly be of not doing the phalloplasty that you would think of doing that. The argument is suicide, of course, and that's the alternative we're looking at. But do the numbers stack up, do you think? Not at all. And th there's sort of two problems with the numbers. One is they just aren't there. It's just not the case that suicidality is at the, or suicide, suicidality means thinking about suicide, so suicidal attempts, let's say. You know, they're just not at the level, in my opinion, at least, that they could possibly outweigh such barbaric um, 
interventions that have such s severe consequences. I mean, remember, these are these are things that are going to sterilise you. And we know that that's a human, we regard that as a human rights abuse uh, when it's done um, for no good reason. Um, mm, really hard to get a hysterectomy if you're, yes. I mean, we don't let women do it until their 30s because we know that too many of them are going to regret doing it, even if they're sure they don't want kids. We would have seen very large numbers of suicides. But the other thing, and the thing that bothers me more, is that mm -hmm. suicidality and suicide are actually socially contagious, which is why any responsible journalist doesn't talk about them the way that the trans lobby wants you to talk about them. You know, they want you to say, would you like a live daughter or a dead son? They want you to say that these are life-saving operations. They should, you know, they were saying they should have gone on during COVID at the beginning when everything not essential was cancelled. They were like, yeah, but these are essential, these operations. But talking like that is what puts in people's minds that if they don't do this, they will feel suicidal. And particularly with young people, they're very susceptible and suggestible that way. So I actually think it's the other way around. Not only is it false that suicide is the thing that stacks up on the other side of the balance when you think about these operations. I think worse than that, talking like that puts suicide on the other side of the balance. It's doubly wicked. Maiden Mother Matriarch is brought to you by Keeper the world's most advanced matchmaking solution. Now, many of you will know that I'm normally extremely suspicious of dating apps like Tinder and Bumble, which tend to produce repeat customers who must endure endless miserable hookups and short-term relationships without ever finding a spouse. Well, Keeper is a completely different kind of service. Its algorithm prioritises immediate attraction, but also, crucially, long-term compatibility, because forever is the goal. Everyone in the Keeper matchmaking pool is there because they want to find a spouse. Using psychometric tests like Big Five, IQ and Masculine and Feminine Polarity, Keeper can accurately predict who you're going to have the strongest chemistry with. The platform only gives you a match if you are an exact fit psychometrically and if the match offers everything that you've told Keeper you're looking for in a partner. It won't waste your time with only good enough matches like other dating apps and matchmaking services will. So find your Keeper at Keeper.ai. That's K-E-E-P-E-R dot A-I. Let's go right back to, to to the political ideology that's brought us here. So I don't know if all listeners or viewers will have heard the term autogynophilia. One of the things that I really value in your, your contribution to this debate, Helen, is that you are not embarrassed about talking about the the fetishistic aspects of this. A lot of people are embarrassed to talk about that, partly because sex is embarrassing and partly because it seems so rude unkind maybe to be honest about about autogynophilia and its role in all of this it, it for, for people who don't know Blanchard's typology roughly how would you how would you explain it to someone who wasn't familiar with it at all okay so if we go back to the 1920s and 30s the first doctors who took seriously any idea that a man who said that he was really a woman. Uh, they were in Germany and that work produced Lily Elba, who's the Danish girl of the film in 2015 that had Eddie Redmayne in it. Uh, brutal surgeries and killed him. I didn't know uh, that, gosh. He lived yeah. about a year after the surgeries. Yeah, yeah, they, he, 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 he was a fantasist. You don't really know what happened to him because the records were all destroyed. Um, the, the, the clinic where he was seen, well, it was a sort of sexology centre, but it was mostly about people who were gay. And the records were destroyed by the Nazis because the guy who oversaw it was Jewish and actually it was a lot of Jewish doctors. So so we don't have any records except what he wrote as to what happened to him. And he was clearly a fantasist if you read the autobiography that he left behind. So he, the whole, he says, for example, that um, he had totally normal male genitalia with external testicles, but that he also, when they operated, discovered two dried, withered up ovaries inside him. Um, but the, the ovaries and the testicles come from the same tissue, so you can't have both. Um, 
And then they gave him uh, an implant of um, young, fit, healthy, beautiful ovaries from a woman in her early 20s. And it does occur to him to ask where these came from. And he was told that, don't worry about that. But at the time, they were taking ovaries out of women for all sorts of things like hysteria. Um, they had this strange theory about um, menstruation that you, you could menstruate anywhere in your body, like that a nosebleed could be vicarious menstruation. And then they would just whip your ovaries out. So it was probably some one of these poor young women who had her life and fertility destroyed. Anyway... Then it was kind of a pause until one of the young doctors in that sort of general set uh, uh, turned up in America and he, in the 1960s, started peddling this sort of stuff, Harry Benjamin. And in the 1970s, uh, some centres started to be opened. Uh, first the one that he opened and then others where people had trained at the one he opened, which quickly closed. And all along... And when I've talked to older people who work in sexology, all along it was known, it was really mostly men that were seen. And those men fell into at least two types and they were basically gay and straight. And I'm talking about in their own sex. So I'm talking about men and I'm saying a man who fancies men is gay. A man who fancies women is straight. Because the language gets flipped as soon as you identify as a woman, they switch it around, the activists. And the gay ones were very notably feminine people who had, weren't particularly deluded about what was going on. They just felt they fitted in much better as women. But the straight ones were confusing because they didn't seem womanly at all. And yet they said that they had a woman inside or that they were really a woman. And they and it was Blanchard who is a, um, he's in Canada, he's based in Toronto and he's still working. Um, he, he posited that these men who at the time were thought of mostly as erotic cross-dressers, because they did, they mostly cross-dressed for masturbatory purposes. And he met one of them who didn't dress. He said, I interviewed him, I met him for my book and he said that this man was an erotic cross-dresser without the clothes. And that was his aha moment. And he said, it's not the clothes that these men are cross-dressing for. They're cross-dressing for the feminine or the female self. So autogynophilia is the term that he created to describe this unusual and complicated sexuality, because that's what it is. It's a man's love for the image of himself as a woman. And often a man can feel like this since his early teens, he grows up, he also fancies women, he gets married, he has kids. And by the time he's in his 40s or 50s, now it's younger now mm -hmm. because of the praise that people get for coming out as trans. But at the time it was in their 40s or 50s, it becomes, you know, it's something that's so central to their self-image and their self-interest. 30 or 40 years they've known this woman inside. And that maybe the children have grown up, maybe the spark's gone from their marriage, you know, different things for different men. But anyway, they now want this thing. They want to be that woman. And the trouble is that what they want isn't to pretend to be a woman or even just the surgical um, simulacrum of a woman. They want to be a woman and they want the rest of us to, to think that too. So I always quote Alice Drager, a journalist and historian who wrote a book about various scientific controversies. And I mean, it's funny, she's now gone quite trans activist herself and claims that there are more than two sexes. But her book in 2015 or 2016, I think, called Galileo's Middle Finger, she talks about the attempts to suppress this sort of research because you're not really meant to talk about this at all. She said, because it's the love that would really rather you did not speak its name. That when you say, oh, you think you're a woman, you, you have this unusual sexuality, you're really a man, but you feel like you're a woman or you should be a woman, or it turns you on to think of yourself as a woman, you're ruining it in a way that you're not ruining it for a gay or a straight person. Like if somebody says, you fancy men, don't you? You've not destroyed anything to me. <laughs> you know. So those men require the rest of us not to talk about what's going on. They require us to talk about them as women. And that to me is the central fact of trans activism, that there is this small core of men who care more than anything else about trying to insist that everybody else thinks of them as women. And you're not allowed to talk about what they're doing even. You're just meant to say that they are women. And then because they have womanhood inside them, children must have girlhood inside them. And so we have the transgender child. The transgender child is the creation of these adults who require it to be hidden, that this is a fetishistic or erotic interest. So we, we used to talk about late transitioners and early transitioners to, to describe the, the autogynophiles generally with the late transitioners. Although, as you say, that is less and less the case because now with greater social acceptance, you know, if they're discovering this interest in puberty, 
they might decide to transition as early as teenagehood or, you know, um, versus the early transitioners who generally very, very feminine young boys who almost invariably um, grow up to be gay if they are, if they're allowed to, if they're not sterile. I mean, Jazz Jennings is the sort of most horrifying example of this, who is the, the, the subject of a long running TV reality series about Jazz's transition is now in a completely miserable state having had botched surgeries and the rest of it um but jazz was a sort of perfect example of this very very feminine little boy um including you know physically feminine i mean this is one of the points where um there is perhaps some conflict between some gender critical feminists and some scientists who might be skeptical of the trans narrative but are also still willing to recognize that there are you know there is there does there is a correlation between being gay and having other feminine traits you know like gay men for instance tend to be smaller on average than straight men tend to be lighter and shorter um the ratios between index and middle fingers and, and that sort of thing betray um lower levels of testosterone i mean there clearly is to some extent a hormonal thing going on or a developmental thing going on which in some instances explains same sex attraction but that isn't to say necessarily that just because you might have a slightly less um, masculine hormone profile, that doesn't make you a woman. <laughs> you know, that's 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 the that's the crazy step that we don't want to countenance. Yeah, and it thinks we knew all of this. So if I read older books, including popular books that were written anything more than about ten years ago, um, and ideally mm. a bit older than that, these things were known. The research had been done. There quite a lot of research had been done on little boys who said that they were really girls mm -hmm. and they really overwhelmingly grew up to be gay. And we even knew what the etiology of it was. The, the way it progressed was you had a little boy who was really highly, and I'm going to say inverted commas feminine and come back to why I put the inverted commas on it. But a little boy who had all these traits that what, you know, what was called sissy boys at the time, the first person who wrote about this, he even put that word in his title, sissy boys, and it wasn't because he was trying to denigrate them. He was trying to comment on the incredible stigmatization of really overt femininity in boys. Well, these poor little boys understood from the world around them that there was something very badly wrong with them. And in particular, that they weren't proper boys. And at some point that turns in on themselves the extreme gender nonconformity came first before the gender dysphoria. The gender dysphoria was created by the fact that they felt terrible about what was their innate nature. And then they started to think, maybe I was really meant to be a girl. They look around and that's what they see. And the reason I put inverted commas on it is I do know what people mean when they call those really sweet little swishy little boys feminine, but they're not exactly feminine. They're not like little girls. So I've started to call it variant masculinity. It, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't want to talk about people too close to me, but I think anyone who is older than a certain age and who knows um, lots of little children will know at least one little boy like this. And if you look at him, he's, you know, he's very flamboyant and flouncy and fey and he's not like little girls little girls aren't like that and he's not copying it from grown-up women because grown-up women aren't like that it's its own thing and i think the same of the the very 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 masculine lesbians that i know you know why i'm calling them masculine and we all know what i mean but they're not actually masculine it's a variant femininity so i think if we were honest with ourselves we'd accept that one or two percent of men are mas masculine in a different way, very different way. And maybe a slightly smaller proportion of women are feminine in a very different way. It doesn't make them members of the opposite sex, but it is innate and it is gendered in the sense that the things those very feminine little boys, the word we used to use was effeminate and effeminate is not the same as feminine. And I don't want to use it because it's a very derogatory word, but that's what we're talking about. Those kids, I, you know, it is gendered. The things they want to do are closer to what girls do, but they're still men. They still grow up to be men. Gay male sexuality is more like mm. straight male mm. sexuality than it is like mm. female sexuality, much more, because they're men. Their object is men, but they like youth. They like variety. Um, I wrote an article once about slash fiction, which is this written by heterosexual women for heterosexual women. 
uh, fanfic in which the protagonists are both straight men, but they're paired in the fanfic. And this is incredibly popular. It's about the most popular sort of fanfic there is. And one of the people I talked to for it said that she had asked some gay male friends to read some of these and they thought they were hysterical. Like nothing like gay men, not at all accurate and just very, very funny. They were like, they were like romance novels. Um, yeah, so the men weren't very manly. So, so, mm-hmm. it, so, so just, mm-hmm. you know, gay men are men. Their sexuality is male. Their interests, yes, okay, they're much more typically female. And we knew all of this. And I mean, I've said this, some of this stuff to some of the young detransitioners I know, and they're completely blown away by it. They've never heard any of it. And these are people who've been through the worst that gender ideology gives you. Like, I remember having lunch with a young lesbian woman who'd been through the whole thing and had come back out the other end severely traumatised by the time she was 23 and sterile. And, um, you know, I was talking about this and she said, but, you know, don't, isn't it just socially constructed? You know, isn't it because uh, the child would copy the mother? I'm like, how many mothers do you know who look like that and act like that? None. No. And people were writing about this accurately in the 1970s. We've gone backwards so badly in our understanding of people's sex, sexuality, um, what the social things that follow from sex are, because there are social things that follow from which sex you are. And instead, we've gone down this 50 year detour. And now that detour has split into an even worse side detour where almost nobody is talking about human beings as human mm. beings are. Mm. It's very and frustrating. And do you think it's been... <sighs> it is very striking that in general, the most influential voices within the, the, the gender ideology movement do tend to be, um, we should assume, autogynophilic. You know, late transitioners have always had female partners. You know, men who've often done really well, actually, in very macho lines of work including business which is one of the reasons why they then have money that they can invest in research and advocacy and so on um you mentioned just before that we're talking maybe one or two percent of um men might have let's say variant masculinity you know show some kind of innate feminine traits do we have any idea what proportion of men have some kind of autogynophilic orientation some interesting cross-dressing that might shade into the full-blown thing if you think about cross-dressing as a spectrum i mean the word spectrum has become ruined for me completely but many things are actually spectra just not sex uh if you think of it as a spectrum between finding this titillating to finding this really titillating to finding it the only way you can get your rocks off to finding it an obsession to finding it something that you would blow your life up over where you are on that isn't just about you it's about your society and the consequences So if cross-dressing means you're going to get arrested, as it did in some American states until not that long ago, you know, 50 years ago or something, then you won't do it. You'll keep that side of you in the closet. Um, If it meant that you were going to not get an education and you were going to just stay in the home and so on, you wouldn't do it either. And then, of course, by doing it, it becomes more part of who you are. So I don't think we can say, oh, it's, you know, I don't think it's like being one of these really very specific style of gay men. I don't think it's such a cut and dried thing, like a naturally occurring phenomenon with a certain rate. Mm. I think it'll be more if we encourage it. And I should say, I'm sure we're going to come on to it, but, you know, anyone who isn't very familiar with this material needs to hear this. And anyone who is, is wondering why we haven't said it yet. This is not the, the scenario now. This is the way it's been with these little boys and these grown Mm. men. Now it's mostly teenage girls and like turning up at gender clinics. But the shape of trans activism was created and all the research was done because no decent research pretty much is done now. It's rubbish, the research that's done now. The decent research before it all became so politicized was on boys and men. And if you think about why these autogynophilic men drive the movement I mean, here's another time, you know, you and I who don't like the word patriarchy are going to crack it out twice in this podcast. These are the people who have money and power. You know, these are hard charging men who've in some cases made a lot of money and who want one thing more than they want anything else and are not in the habit of hearing the word no. So if you look at what trans activism aims for, the specifics of what it aims for, it aims for gender self-ID. That's it. That's the entire legislative and cultural Uh, aims of trans activism who wants self-id you know not the not the young gay man who 
just finds that life goes a lot better when he cross-dresses and presents himself as a woman. You know, he probably passes reasonably well in any way. He just wants to get on with his life. It's these guys because they don't pass at all and because they want everybody else to play along. They want to force everybody else to play along. And that means that getting gaining the legal status of womanhood, not just fitting in, it's a legal status. And that is the tell to me of whose interests are being considered here. Self-ID isn't in women's interests. And I don't, I, I mean, trans-identified women's interests. If you're a woman who says you're a man, you're not safe in men's spaces. And if you pass, okay, you can probably use the toilets and the rest, but you're just, you're just not going to be safe. You're not going to be fast enough to win in men's sports. And I think they know this because you never hear women pressing for, tra you know, you never, I've never heard of a case of a female prisoner pressing to be transferred to a men's prison. I have, I've heard occasionally. Okay. Yeah, I, I think there's one I've heard of. It's absolute madness and the prisons won't move them. Like suddenly they realise that a woman will be very in, very much in danger in a men's jail without registering yeah. that putting men in women's jails puts the women at, at risk. So yeah, you, the, the tell, the, the, you know, the qui bono thing of it is the people who benefit from the way that trans activism is on the ground is middle-aged men who don't pass, who want legal status mm -hmm. as women so they can force themselves into women's spaces. And that's not, um, that, that's not actually the broad sweep of who identifies as trans now. Um, it never was particularly useful for any female who did or for uh, gay males. But now it's mostly uh, teenage women, who teenage girls and women who are pushing for this. And that's a new etiology. I don't think there was a paper before about 2010 about teenage girls who suffered gender dysphoria, not one. And there's been research, you know, not much of it. And then maybe for the last 30, 40 years, a sort of a decent amount, although it was a fringe subject, people were not seeing teenage girls at any of the clinics ever. And I'd say that there's a new sort of male as well uh, transitioning and that's, that that is very much internet and technology mediated. There are teenage boys and, you know, it's very hard to tell what's going on in someone else's life. You could say, well, these are autogynophilic boys who are coming out really early compared with before. But, you know, people who know them say that some of them, it just, it just doesn't fit. That's not who they are. They're boys who are fleeing from what they think of as toxic masculinity. They're often autistic. They spend all their time online. They've maybe even been groomed online. Um, they have totally unrealistic ideas of what it is, like what, what's, what, what technology is capable of doing for them. And they just think life would be better and easier as a girl. And also it's kind of titillating and they're ki kind of messed up. So I think the internet is creating a new set, a new, some new presentations of gender dysphoria or trans identity. Yeah, I mean, yes, gosh. I mean, there are so many ways in which this is a uh, a phenomenon partially created by the internet. It is, I'm sure, part of what's going on with these young men and also with the young women who are who who are mass identifying as 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 trans and non-binary. It, it's that feeling of if you're spending so much of your young life operating in in virtual mode where you can be anything you want to be and you can just change your avatar and you've changed your entire self you know why not transfer that to to meet space <laughs> you know and try and make that true in the rest of your life as well um i'm sure porn is playing a part in this as well i don't know if you've read andrea long chu much um, Andrew Longshu is a trans. I read parts. Yeah, of it. I actually think Females is a really good book. Uh, it's 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 often offensive, and um, kind of crazed in bits. But uh, Longshu, is just, he, he <laughs> has uh, really good prose, and actually, there's an amazing amount of insight in Females, which is one of the reasons that actually trans activists didn't. A lot of them really didn't like it. Um, and we're very annoyed with Chief for having written it because there was a degree of sort of airing the airing the dirty laundry because because Chu writes really explicitly about the role of porn in you know probably there was some kind of native cross dressing interest but there are certain genres of porn like sissy hypno porn for instance which I've never personally viewed but which I have read about is is amazingly good apparently at sort of cultivating this interest and embedding it further and and this you know this whole model of sexuality which i think is maybe derived from freud a very po very popular model of sexuality where you have like a, a fixed kind of sexuality in qu quantity and quality and you just have to kind of vent it periodically it's clearly not true clearly there is a positive cycle involved in so much of this stuff and you can kind of 
you know, neural pathways can become neural motorways if you give them enough um, stimulation. I'm sure that that's a big part of the reason why you have this, you know, maybe 3% of men interested in cross-dressing. You have more and more men progressing along the conveyor belt t- towards actually identifying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, men, men, men care about uh, uh, novelty in sex. And now you can see anything you like. And, you know, there's things like not even just on trans issues, but, you know, if you want, if you, if you want to be peed on or, you know, hurt or something like that, like, I'd like to think that those are things that I could not be persuaded to like. But obviously quite a large number of people can be bit by bit. And it'd be better if that door was never opened. I often think of doors opening in people's minds because once doors open, they can never be closed. And there's a strange model of thinking about identity, sexuality, other, and not just sexuality, but other aspects of, of identity. At the moment, a lot of people and a lot of young people think that there's a true self and the job of your childhood, youth and early adulthood is to find your true self. And because they're also non-judgmental and like, you know, ethics are personal or something like that, the job is to find your kinks, for example. Like, are you the sort of person who'd like BDSM? Are you the sort of person who'd like being peed on? Um, you know, would you like to be humiliated? Do you have a breeding fetish? I don't know what. I mean, I think most of these things, if there are possibilities in your mind, wouldn't it be better to just go through your life never even knowing that? But if you have this self-knowledge idea of what it is to be a good a good person, a a right person living well, then it's your job to find out. So it's your job to kind of peruse the whole of P- P- Pornhub's output to discover, you know, which of the which ninety five of the ten thousand things on offer are you. Even if like ninety four of those things would have been better if you'd never known them. And in fact, you know, is a fetish that you never even knew you had a fetish? Probably not. It's not even a thing. And um, and I think you can do step by step as well. You know, you, you, you look for more extreme. Men do look for more extreme, especially. Yes. yes. And I think the porn platforms encourage it as well because it suits their business model to do exactly that. Yes. But I mean, and, well, Andrew Long Chu, to mention um, him again, is one of the very few people. I, I think there is a line in females which says something like porn made me trans very rare to hear sissy porn did make me trans yes yes well remembered very rare to hear someone saying that that explicitly which is of course the reason why so many people trans people really cross <laughs> about the book because you're not supposed to say that and i think the other thing about the way that um, long chu writes about it is i think it's probably the case that a lot of us have um impulses or ideas about what might we might find sexy that are kind of a bit shameful to us for whatever reason. And the idea of accessing those is maybe made a bit easier if you put them onto something or somebody else. So men who might like to be humiliated or dominated, it might be easier for them to accept that if they think of it as happening to a woman than happening to a man. Like the sexism of thinking as Andrea Longchu does that wanting to be buggered specifically turns you into a female like that's what yeah, I mean, he says that um the, the the asshole is a universal vagina meaning it's the vagina that every human being has um and i mean it's just you know it's grossly offensive but it only makes sense if you think that to be buggered is to be humiliated and to be humiliated is to be female like he can't stop at just i'd like to be buggered that would get me off he has to he has to go that step further, as that makes me a girl. Yeah, to, to raise the, the patriarchy word again. I, <laughs> I mean, this 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 deserves a whole other hour of conversation. Just the, the the issue of patriarchy, whether it whether it describes something real. I think that there is something. I think very often when people talk about patriarchy, they don't actually mean the sort of old anthropological idea of a society in which power is vested in 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 the patriarch in men and, and that you know property can only be owned by men and things like that because we don't live in one of those anymore even if we did up until relatively recently i think often when people use the word patriarchy what they're actually describing is something much more um amorphous to do with status the way in which things associated with women are just kind of lower status my theory on this is very difficult to prove is that it's because 
women are associated with children and children are always lower status in a society it's not that we hate children it's not that you know we we can we can we can adore children but we do regard children as being lower status and less intelligent and less capable of self self-governing because they are and i think that women end up psychologically associated with children and therefore that's that that childishness kind of rubs off on us in all states. That's that's my personal theory. Regardless, it clearly is the case that women are just considered to be lower status in all sorts of ways. We see this in the way that effeminacy in young boys is despised in a way that masculinity in tomboy girls doesn't tend to be. And we see this in, say, the way Andrew Longchu writes about being submissive in sex as being a a female thing not just being you know the passive partner but being degraded you know there is something there is something degrading about pretending to be a woman in the bedroom is clearly a very very widely held view among men with an interest in this kind of porn and of course women we discover this and we're offended yeah and there's cultures where you're only a gay man if you want to be the receiving partner you know a man who is buggering another man is not Mm. gay Oh, that I mean, that was true in that was true in English culture up until not all that long ago as well. It's a very common view of homosexuality. Yeah, I mean, my my definition, my working definition of what might still be called patriarchy, is that men are subject and women are object. Men are hum- fully human, and women are only partially human at best. So, if you think about the subject object thing, everybody's both, obviously, and especially as sexual beings, we're both. Because we look at others and we desire others and we choose others and we act towards them. But we are also objects to other people's sexual gaze and interests and desires and actions. And that's quite uncomfortable because other people can reject you. And they, so it's easier if you're able to live the world, live, live through your life as only subject. And a lot of men are like that. Like they know that, of course, they're not going to get every woman they want. I don't mean that. But, you know, if you're married or... If you've decided that girls aren't for you because, frankly, you're online 19 hours a day and sleeping the other five, you don't have to face the fact that other people are weighing you up and finding you on, finding you wanting, in particular, as possible sexual partners. So a gay friend of mine, a gay man friend, was saying uh, recently that he thinks that one of the reasons that straight men can sometimes be very homophobic and dislike gay men is they don't like the idea that those men are judging them mm. as potential sexual beings. They don't like to think about it. And of course, women are all the time. But we aren't noticed doing it. But then we also like to be objects sometimes too. It's enjoyable when you think that your object of desire finds you also an object of desire. And women dress up for reasons. Like, you know, we don't just put on those clothes and go out looking as lovely as we can for no reason. So a man who wants to feel like an object is thereby putting himself in a role that culture our culture puts only women in women are sexual you know women are the sex women are the sexualized object men aren't men choose and women perform sex so i think that's a lot of what andrea longchu is talking about he wants to be looked at the way that he thinks only women can be looked at um and then also like the part and parcel of that is the thing that you see all through for example the way that owen jones talks about women that he just doesn't see us as human we're just support animals we're there for the having of babies, the being you know, carrying on of the human race, the being mothers, the being compliant handmaidens, telling him he's wonderful. Yeah, so we're scenery. Um, so that to me is what I would say patriarchy is, seeing that only men are subjects and regarding women as mm. uh, semi-human. Yes, and there clearly are animals. some men who, again, misogyny is not a word I want to overuse, but there clearly are some men who... Um, I think probably because they are they are fully convinced that women are lower status than men, and when men, and then when women appear to be challenging that hierarchy, or, or, or an individual woman is unusually high status for whatever reason, they find that appalling on an, on an emotional level and become very angry. And clearly, those men have had an absolute field day <laughs> in the last ten twenty years of of uh, gender ideology's ascendance. Because what a wonderful opportunity to rail against your mum. Yes, exactly. I mean, where would you be if you were a misogynistic man? You'd be, yeah, you'd be, you'd be at one of these protests, you know, carrying a sign saying yep. decapitate turfs. A, a real sign at a, re- at a recent, I think it was in Scotland. It's, it's almost the last acceptable prejudice. Yeah, yeah, the grotesque level of misogyny in this is... is um, it was, yeah. Hard to, you have to see it to believe it. It's that bad. 
before before I let you go, I want to talk a bit about um, the relationship between gender critical feminism and the left and the right. You took part in a very interesting debate recently with Julie Bindle at Unheard on whether or not um, feminists should work with the right, um, the far right or the centre right, depending on depending on how you want to frame it. And um, you were quite uh, quite open about the fact that you are not part of the left. Um, it's so often that the, the, the assumption in gender critical feminism is that, well, of course, you know, we are all part of the left and we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're the sort of the true left, the true feminist, whatever. But increasingly, increasingly not. Increasingly, actually, I think there are more gender critical feminists who are saying, actually, no, I'm, 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 I'm in the centre, I'm on the right, whatever. I actually don't have a relationship with the left. Um, Posey Parker is one example of someone who has really kind of departed from the left um, while still being very firmly bedded, embedded in this kind of um, gender critical activism and being, I think, a very successful activist. And this is causing no end of, um, of infighting and heartache in feminist circles. I'm someone who I think is... I'm still occasionally described by other people as being on the left, but I don't consider myself to be on the left anymore. And I actually think that the sort of no true Scotsman arguments around uh, true true leftist activism and you know would never be as misogynistic as it has been in recent years. I just don't really find convincing any more. Yeah, at some point you've got to say you know communism was never tried. You know. <laughs> yes, and um, and actually maybe there's a. Maybe there are seeds within leftist ideology that, that that will lead us here. Always, I mean, utopianism, um, the kind of radical egalitarianism that actually demands very serious social interventions. The whole idea of nurture trumping nature always, nature not even having a having a look in. I, I think actually those ideas can have very benign manifestations, but I think they can also have. Um, much more troubling manifestations, and I think that the trans activism is is a product of them. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And of course, there are things that within the left that are inimical to trans activism. In particular, the communitarian style mm -hmm. of left wing um, organising and thinking. You know, in, in which people are understood to be part of a class. It's not not something you can opt out of being a woman. That women's struggle is a struggle for all women. And although I've never, ever regarded myself as being left wing, I'm kind of radically anti putting myself on any political spectrum. Um, I mean, really for character purposes, and I don't say it's a good or a bad thing. I think it's a character trait. I, I very much dislike the idea of being part of clubs. Mm. You know, I'd like to have the, I think it was Groucho Marx or someone, include me out, you know, as kind of a motto. So it's more that than any sort of association with particular po points on the on the spectrum, the political spectrum, than... But also, and I mean, I wouldn't have worked at The Economist if I didn't feel like this. The people who suffer most when countries are poor and when they're badly run and when they're dangerous are always women and children. Um, I'm not talking about countries at war, by the way, because in countries at war, men die in very large numbers. I'm just talking about you know, everyday danger and poverty and violence, as I saw in Brazil when I lived there. So when you make countries safer and richer, you disproportionately benefit women and children. So if you care about women and children, as I do, actually the policies that are most important to promote aren't on the face of them to do with women and children. They're keeping interest rates low. They're stabilising government debt. They're doing the things that help people to open and run businesses without going bankrupt. Uh, they're thinking about the rule of law, having a less corrupt police force and so on. And none of these are ever framed as feminist policies, but actually they're the most feminist policies. Mm -hmm. Like the best thing that was ever done for women in Brazil was ending hyperinflation. And that is a, you know, not a policy that you see on feminist manifestos at all. Like they're always about the redistribution after the stabilising the public um, debt and pub the public um, finances. So that's why I would say that on those sorts of things, I'm solidly centre right. You know, you, you sound fiscal policy plus a decent redistribution system is far and away the best way to run a country. And in particular, it's best for women and children. And you never hear about this in left wing parties unless they are so, so close to the centre that they think of themselves as a third way. Where do you see this going? Well, I mean, my, my, my guess is I think that feminism is probably moving to the right or at least some sections of it are moving to the right, partly because of this influx of women 
into gender critical activism and, and, and to do with women uh, being able to participate online in political discourse in a way that they couldn't pre-internet, you know, because actually most women are quite conservative. Most women are mums and and care deeply about issues to do with motherhood and children. You know, m m I think that if if more women participated in feminism, it would become more small-c conservative just because of the nature of the population. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at academic feminism and movement feminism for totally obvious and non-malign reasons, it's dominated by women who are healthy, young and childless. Um, you know, academics and people senior in business, women are much less likely to have children if they're academics or they're senior in business, because it's very hard to combine those sorts of jobs with motherhood in the way it isn't with fatherhood. And that means that almost inevitably, the people who organise for women and speak for women are atypical women. Uh, the more of them are lesbians, more of them are very highly educated and more of them are childless. But to the extent that you can get women who aren't any of those things involved, as you say, because of being able to be online and being able to organise locally in women's rights networks and so on, those women bring feminism back to more mainstream, um, like more representative of the population. And I don't want to overstate this because I, th I know a lot of women who are movement feminists whose primary concern, and Julie Bindel will be a good example of that, like she's a childless lesbian, um, but you know, her concern is poor women, poor children, victims of male violence. Yeah, yeah. Like she's not. No, no, you can't, you can't fault Julie on that at all. Yeah. No, you absolutely can't. So, so, and, and that would be true. I think of a lot of the left, left wing women I admire that they organize for women who have no voices. So I'm absolutely not saying that those women always stick to their own class preoccupations. I'm just saying you're just talking about an unusual group of people. And in academia, I think it has led to far more interest and concern in what are basically minority or marginal concerns for the broad mass of human, of, of women's lives. So thinking very hard about microaggressions, um, you know, trying to find and analyze texts looking for you know hidden messages about what men and women are like when you know out there there's bloody prostitution on the streets and there's kids being taught bullshit about their bodies like so to the extent that people who are just faced with living on low wages or you know without a man at all in the house or with the bad, wrong man or a bad man in the house are able to feed their concerns into women's organising. That's a good thing. So I admire the women I know who do very grassroots organising because it keeps them real. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the view, this is my view as to why feminism ought to exist and ought to exist in, indefinitely, um, not because of a sort of grand patriarchy narrative, but because there are certain essential things about women, motherhood being top of the list, but also our physical smallness and so on. And our, I would say our agreeableness as well. I think there's a, there are psych, one of the psychological differences between men and women is that women just do tend to be much more kind of um, self-abnegating than men and, and less likely to 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 fight strongly for their political interests than men. I think that's why feminism needs to exist, basically to counteract that effect, which will otherwise leave women voiceless in politics. And unfortunately, in recent decades, it hasn't really worked. <laughs> yes. Yes. If you think about aims to go 50-50. Yeah. If you go 50-50 with men and women in politics, you are drawing your women from a group that will not mostly include new mothers. I mean, there are there are the occasional women who do stay in politics, but you are, you are just going to always in public facing roles and in the jobs where policies are set. So, you know, government economists, think tanks, all of these places, you're just going to have fewer women available for those jobs. Now, we're better educated than men are, and we're starting to work more than men. So to some extent, that counteracts it. And women are having much fewer children. But there's a structural problem with um, policy making in the public sp sphere, which is that women, for part of their lives, large numbers of women are in the private yes, sphere. Yes, yes. And this is surely played out exactly in the way you describe when it comes to gender ideology, because the I don't know if there's any figures on this, but my very strong anecdotal um, evidence of my eyes is that uh, mums are much more likely to be TERFs, much more likely. It's not just an age thing, it's a life cycle thing. And when there are fewer mums in positions of influence, then they are less than that, then that view is less likely to be voiced. 
But that's why sex matters and so on yeah. exists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the same thing that makes you notice that sex is real, namely removing an entire other human being from your entrails, is the same thing that distracts you from actually spending your days telling people yeah. <laughs> that sex matters because you're bloody well busy. Like the, the most extraordinary thing about being involved in this is just how incredibly busy all the women involved in it are. There's mothers, there's people caring for elderly parents, there's a lot of people on low income, there's a lot of people with health issues. You know, a lot of absolutely furious women with no spare time whatsoever giving up their time free. And against us is this enormous, you know, systematic, often government funded lobbying of wasteful, you know, bureaucracy, charities, inverted commas, do-gooders. Often I have to say young women, like the people who work in the charitable sector and the NGOs and the people who are fighting to take away women's rights are really now quite disproportionately young women. That's very depressing because I'm sure that when they're in their 30s, if they have kids, they will realise what idiots they were and what harms they did. Well, actually, I don't know if they'll ever say that sentence that they personally got it wrong. They'll think, why is the world not fixed and maybe not realise that they are part of the reason. But yeah, it's a life cycle thing. And that's another reason why women do need uh, organised feminism is we're broken up into life cycle parts in a way that men aren't. Uh, and our interests are often not aligned with women who are in different parts of the life cycle or indeed other women. So women who are being supported by their husbands, as most mothers are at some point, uh, for that time, their interests are aligned with men. So if their husband is working, it, it's not in their interests to be thinking about promoting women over men or worrying about equal pay for women in the workplace. What's in their interests is men's interests for that, that period. You need to have some solidarity to carry you through that. But young women don't want to turn into middle-aged women because they see how middle-aged women are despised by the men that they care about attracting. They don't like to think about being old women who are the most disposable people in society. And so women are... Um, you know, the solidarity between women is so obviously hard to keep going and to cover all the, the ranges of women and also the policies that we need are so different. The policies that a woman at childbearing age needs are so different from the policies for a woman post childbearing age and in old age. That's just not true for men. Men are a spectrum. They don't break into these episodic parts of life the way we do. So for all these reasons, I think we need to really think separately and specifically about what women need. And we always will need to do that. We're much more complex yes. than men. That's why I called the podcast Maiden Mother Matriarch, because my, my, my proposition is that there is a sort of lack of integration of different stages of a woman's life. And as you say, we, we don't want to become mothers and matriarchs because we see how they are despised. And so we get stuck in perpetual maiden mode. But there are... Yeah, all sorts of political problems that come with that because it's not it's not describing reality. I mean, uh, the, the the heroic work that you do with Sex Matters is very hard. You are up against very powerful lobbying organisations. On the plus side, you do have reality on your side. <laughs> reality and very, very angry women, in particular angry mothers. <laughs> Could you tell viewers and listeners uh, a little bit about your role at Sex Matters and about your book and about generally where people can go and find more of you? Sure. So until relatively recently, I was a staffer at The Economist. I worked there for 17 years and had a ball and it was a great place. But then I discovered that there were large numbers of people who were pretending to think that sex isn't real or that you can overwrite it with gender identity. And so I wrote a book called Trans When Ideology Meets Reality, and it came out a year and a half ago now, a bit over a year and a half ago. And I thought that when I was writing it, that maybe I would get it out of my system and write it all down and then I could move on. But it turns out that it's this idiotic idea is not dying with any speed. It's going to have to be slain like a vampire and stakes through hearts and the rest. So I decided that I would um, join a newish, I think it's about two years old now, group founded by Maya Forstatter and a bunch of lawyers, which is called Sex Matters, strapline in law and in life, or in life and law, sorry. Um, and the idea is to just reaffirm what we actually have, which are pretty good laws that understand that sex mostly doesn't matter, but when it matters, it's sex that matters. But policy has drifted very long, very far from that law, and there are attempts to destroy those laws with gender self-ID as is happening in Scotland. So yeah, I started there. I took a year out to do that and decided to stay because sex does still matter and we're not doing enough about it. Um, I also write a newsletter on thehelenjoyce.com 
some poor woman is called called Helen Joyce, got HelenJoyce.com first. And I don't dare get in touch with her and say, how's that going for you? <laughs> but I'm the HelenJoyce.com so people can read my newsletters there. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Helen, thank you so much. Thanks, Louise. It was lovely to chat to you.